Welcome to or welcome back to Wrong Sports. And to start off the new college football season, I'm doing another series. In my first episode, I talked all about the most important ties in college football history. Now for the next few episodes, I'm going to be talking all about upsets. I have the best upsets before 1945, the best upsets nobody talks about, the strangest upsets, plus I'm going to be going over the biggest busted teams before 2000. But right now in this video, I am going to be going over the best or most significant upsets in college football before 1945. And the reason why I'm choosing the era before 1945 is because a lot of stuff changed in college football after World War II. So this time in college football was very different. A lot of teams were getting introduced, a lot of big changes, rule changes, just things in college football were changing very quickly. So I wanted to do this as a whole error. Plus I've actually found 10 upsets before 1945. So that's another reason why. Also, I won't be ranking these upsets, but I will be going in chronological order because again, it is really tough to rank these upsets as there isn't much, or in the case of half this list, any video footage. So it's very tough to gauge uh, the teams and just how big of an upset these actually were. But before I get to the list, I want to mention one that will not be making this list. And that's from 1922 when Alabama beat Penn. It was a huge upset for the South, but there will be another big upset for the South on this list. And before I get to the list, make sure you subscribe to the channel below. Also, make sure you like this video and share this video with other college football fans. And of course, check out my social media. Help out my channel on my Patreon right now and check out my podcast. You you can see all that in the description below. But the first big upset on my list is actually going to be a few games. It's 1899 and Suwannee's five wins on the road in six days. And I'm starting this off because they won five games in six days all on the road. That is just insane. And this team is the stuff of legends and you will always hear about this road trip and this team if you listen to any college football historian or fan of Southern college football. But let's start with Suwannee, which is a small Southern school located in Southern Tennessee and taking the name of their school from the town they are in. They were a small but a tough school that was making a name for themselves in the early days of college football. It was so early that Suwannee, like most Southern teams, played less than 10 seasons of college football at this point. But Suwannee were getting pretty good as in 1898 they were 4-0. And this year they would be playing 11 games with 10 for Southern schools in the old Southern Conference or the SIAA. And most of these games would be on the road. The reason for that was because of a disagreement the previous year with Vanderbilt on gate receipts and their game was cancelled. And this would have been a big game for both of them as they were Tennessee rivals. So to make up for it, Sewanee scheduled a brutal five game road trip all done in six days from November 9th through the 14th. And the games would have Sewanee travel to Texas and Louisiana on overnight trips of at least 300 miles. They would also have 11 players on this team, meaning they played all 60 minutes of the game, then got on a train to sleep it off for the next game. And just hearing that, you would think that this team would have to be tough. And yeah, they were because they survived it. And they survived it in a dominating way as they shut out all of their well-known opponents on this road trip. Like first shutting out Texas and Texas A&M on back-to-back -back days, November 9th and 10th by a total of 22 to nothing. Then they had to sleep it off on a 350 mile train trip to Louisiana and shut out Tulane on November 11th. They had their only day off in New Orleans on the 12th and most of the team had a nice day some did party but they couldn't really enjoy it because then they had to go to baton rouge on november 12th to shut out lsu by the largest score 34 to nothing on this road trip and then finally the road trip brought them back to tennessee to memphis to play old miss and this resulted in another shutout but would signal the end of this epic road trip I know it might be hard to say that these are upsets, but Suwannee then was a smaller school and smaller than all of their opponents during this run. And this epic road trip is something that will never be able to be replicated as going 5-0 and and outscoring their opponent 91 to nothing in six days is something that isn't allowed to be done by any team now. Up next is an upset that ended the first dynasty of the West. 
Well, Michigan was called the West in the 1905 season and were known as the best team from the Western Conference, which is now known as the Big Ten Conference. Michigan under Fielding H. Yost were unbeaten since he came to campus in 1901, with their only blemish being a 1903 tie versus Minnesota. Yost's team at Michigan were called the Point a Minute teams, due to them scoring insane amounts during this time, and this was a time where touchdowns were worth less than six points. But his teams managed to score over 2,000 points over those four unbeaten seasons, and in the first 12 games of the 1905 season, Michigan won all those 12 games by a total combined score of 495 to 0. Chicago, meanwhile, were coached by the legend and one of the earliest coaches and creators of American football in Amos Alonzo Stagg. Stagg had basically created the Chicago program, and I went over that in my discontinued video about the Chicago football team. You can see a link to that above. And Stagg was also the last coach to beat the Michigan team, going all the way back to the 1900 season. This year's game was going to be for the Western Conference title, and perhaps for the national title, even though there really wasn't one, there was just a whole bunch of voters and sports writers who named their best team. But this was going to be one of the biggest games of the year, so perhaps the winner would be named the best team because of it. And since this game was between two undefeated teams, this game was a slugfest, with neither team being able to get in the end zone, and in fact, no team really got ever close to scoring range. But since I had a list for best ties, this game didn't end in one, as in the final minutes of play, Michigan player Denny Clark was tackled for a safety as he attempted to return a punt from behind the goal line. The safety gave Chicago some points, and since they stopped Michigan from scoring, which hadn't happened in over five years, they won the game 2 to nothing. The win gave Chicago a perfect 11-0 record and the Western Conference title, and also being known as the team that was able to stop Fielding H. Yost's point-a-minute team. And number three on my list of biggest upsets before 1945 is 1907 Carlisle beats Harvard and Penn in less than a month. Now, a lot of college football fans know Carlisle because of the legendary Jim Thorpe, but these two upsets were before he made a name for himself. But Thorpe was actually on the Carlisle team in 1907. He was mostly on the bench, but did play some kickoff and punt return, but he would later be a star in about two years. The star this year was their fullback Peter Hauser, as he started to show his talents during the first six games as the team won all of them, and he was handling kicking duties for Carlisle, returning punts, and was also the mainstay of the defense, so he played pretty much every single play for them. But he would make a name for himself on October 26, 1907, as Carlisle beat a Penn team that had won every other game and was declared national champion that year. And the game wasn't even a close one either, as Carlisle beat Penn 26-6 before a big crowd of 20,000 people at Franklin Field in Philadelphia. Carlisle and Hauser really ended the game with their passing, which at the time involved short tosses, mostly screen passes, but in this game, Hauser threw a 40-yard pass, hitting his receiver in stride, and it led to another touchdown. The forward pass wasn't invented in this game, as it was just starting to gain notoriety this season, but hitting a receiver in stride 40 yards down the field is pretty incredible for 1907. This game would also help the forward pass gain a lot more notoriety, since it happened versus a pen team in Philadelphia in front of 20,000 people and Penn was one of the biggest teams in college football and pretty much in all sports at this time. Carlisle's epic road trip continued as they would have to go to Princeton after this game where they unfortunately lost to Princeton. This ruined their perfect season but they would follow it up with three straight wins all on the road again as they went to Boston and beat Harvard 25 to 13 which got the New York Times to call Hauser's runs marvels, but Carlisle wouldn't have much time to celebrate because they would have to go all the way to Minnesota the next week and play Minnesota, beating them 12 to 10, and then go to Chicago in their season finale and beat the Maroons, coached by Amos Alonzo Stagg, to end the season 10 and 1. And I'm using these 1907 upsets instead of the 1911 and 1912 upsets by Jim Thorpe, because these 1907 upsets really put Carlisle on the map. And these are upsets that really no one talks about because everyone likes to talk about the Jim Thorpe upsets. No one really likes to talk about the 1907 Peter Hauser upsets where he was just throwing 40-yard bombs down the field. 
And number four on the list of upsets pre-1945 is an upset from a team that you wouldn't think would be the Giant Slayer, but they were in 1913. It's Notre Dame beating Army. This game was a huge upset at the time, and it helped create the lore and tradition of Notre Dame. This is one of the few times Notre Dame was the underdog in a game, and also one of the last times that Notre Dame was unknown. Notre Dame in 1913 was so unknown that their head coach Jesse Harper wrote two dozen or so universities around the East and the South that could draw him fans or give him a share of the gate to come play his team. It didn't work for a lot of teams, but it ended up working for Army, who were losing teams that were willing to play them, and accepted a game versus Notre Dame, and was also willing to pay Notre Dame $1,000 for the game. The reason for Army losing games was due to Army having different requirements for cadets, and would recruit older players or players that had many years of college football experience. The reason for Army being allowed to do this was just because. So they had an advantage and were called one of the best teams in 1913. Army was also 4-0 going into the game after beating Eastern teams like Rutgers and Tufts, while Notre Dame played their first three games at home, beating South Dakota and smaller Michigan school Alma College to be 3-0. But even though Army were big favorites, they weren't ready for what Notre Dame was going to throw at them, which was the forward pass. And in this game, Notre Dame used it to perfection. The Irish quarterback was Gus DeRay, who in this game threw 17 passes, which was unheard of at the time, completing 14 of them for 243 yards. In 2020, that would be considered a pretty damn good stat line, and most of these passes happen in the first half, with DeRay's top target being future Notre Dame head coach Newt Rockney, giving Notre Dame a 14-13 lead going into the half. After halftime, it was all Notre Dame, as Army didn't know what was in store for them, and Notre Dame instead started to run the ball, allowing for three fourth quarter touchdowns to give Notre Dame the incredible 35-14 win. The win would make headlines around the New York City area, giving the small school from northern Indiana a lot of credit and also gaining them a lot of Irish fans that were living in New York in the early part of the century. And this game and win would also be a big reason why Newt Rockney would continue to schedule games in New York City as well as other areas around the country to gain more fans for his small Midwestern school. Up next on the list is from 1917 and it's Georgia Tech's shutout over Penn. So not only was this an upset, but it was a dominating shutout for the Giant Slayer, a southern school with the legend John Heisman coaching them in Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech was coming into this game with Heisman in his 14th year coaching, but over the last two years the team was unbeaten with two ties, and this year they were looking to stay unbeaten and also get a national title. The one way to do that was to play more than just Southern schools. Georgia Tech had never played an Eastern or Midwestern school, so being able to schedule one of the most powerful Eastern teams in Penn was a big deal for the school. The University of Pennsylvania, meanwhile, were coming off of a loss in the Rose Bowl the previous year, but were a team to play due to winning several national titles already and being one of the original college football teams. Penn had played Michigan for several years and had a winning record against them, but scheduling Georgia Tech was the first time they had ever scheduled a Southern school. What was bigger was that Penn would be traveling to Georgia Tech, which rarely happened in those days too. Most of the time, you had to travel to Pennsylvania, or you had to travel to Harvard, or Yale, or Princeton. But even though Georgia Tech had not lost a game in two years, they were seen as an underdog, but quickly showed that Southern football was on par or better than Eastern football, as Georgia Tech would score on their second play of the game and continued the onslaught as they won 41 to nothing. The win was so dominant that this was one of the worst losses Pennsylvania had ever suffered, and it was to a Southern school, not an Eastern school, which showed even more about Georgia Tech and was a big reason why many sports writers chose them as the best college football team of 1917. And to kick off the latter half of the list at number six, this is the quintessential upset people look at when they talk about the first big upset in college football history. It's 1921, Center College beats Harvard. 
And yes, they are right because this is a top five upset of all time because at this point in college football, Harvard were the Alabama of college football. They had won the national title in 1919 and 1920 and had not lost a game in over two years. But it was to a naval all-star team, so really they hadn't lost to a college team in over four years. Center College, meanwhile, were a small southern school with just about 200 students, but were one of the best southern schools due to their great back Bo McMillan. McMillan was a triple threat that could run, pass, and kick, and had led Center College to a 9-0 record in 1919, and in 1920 he would get even better, as he would lead Center College to score over 50 points per game in their 10 games, only losing to Georgia, which was their first Southern loss in over two years. Center College would also lose to Harvard in 1920, but in 1921, Center College would be on a tear again, and looking to avenge those losses, as they were 4-0, scoring over 30 points per game, and would get a rematch with Harvard. Harvard, meanwhile, were unbeaten at 5-0-1, with their only setback being a Penn State tie the week before this game. And this game would be played in Boston, since the only way to play Harvard back in the day was to play them in Boston. And this game would be a slugfest. It was 0-0 throughout most of the way, until Bo McMillan took a carry to the house to score the only touchdown of the game and gain the upset and put them in the record books forever with their Center College 6, Harvard 0 upset. It would later be written C6H0 because that was the signs that Center College football team would see when they came home, as that was the formula to beat the mighty Harvard squad. The seventh biggest upset before 1945 in college football is a game that changed the South, as it is called. It's the 1926 Rose Bowl, Alabama beating Washington. And it really kind of is the game that changed the South, because at this point, East and Northern schools were regarded as the best, even though there were earlier upsets, as I have noted already in previous lists, but this was the first real time a Southern school would be invited to the biggest game of the year, the Rose Bowl. The reason was because a lot of Eastern schools had took more of an academic stance in the 1920s and declined to play a bowl game. Due to this, Rose Bowl officials had to invite somebody and would choose the undefeated Alabama team and the best Southern team to be invited to the Rose Bowl this year. Alabama were coached by Wallace Wade, who was in his third season in Tuscaloosa and had only lost three times, but were undefeated this season with eight shutouts. But even though Alabama and Wade thought they deserved the invite, the invite was more of a, we need someone to come to the Rose Bowl and get trounced by Washington, as Washington was known to have a bigger and more powerful team than anyone this season, and they were 10-0-1. They were also led by All-American George Wild Cat Wilson, and they were looking for their first Rose Bowl win. When the game started, it looked like it was going Washington's way, as Wilson would lead the team to two touchdowns before the half, but they missed both extra points, so it was only 12-0. In the third quarter, though, and most of the fourth quarter, Wilson wasn't playing, which completely turned this game around, and Alabama took the advantage with three touchdowns and a few passes sprinkled in there to take the lead and hold on to win 20 to 19. The win gave the South their first ever Rose Bowl and officially put Alabama on the map. The number eight biggest upset before 1945 is from 1926, and it's Carnegie Tech's epic upset over Notre Dame. So remember how I mentioned Notre Dame being a small, unknown Midwest school? Well, in the 13 years after that Army win, Notre Dame gained a lot of fame and a lot of wins, as they went undefeated in 1919, 1920, and 1924. But in 1926, many people were calling this Notre Dame squad Newt Rockne's best squad. The reason for that was because Notre Dame was 8-0 on the year and had only given up one touchdown all season. Yes, this defense was giving up less than one point per game and beating the likes of Army, Georgia Tech, and Minnesota. There were only two games left and everyone was calling Notre Dame the national champions, as long as they could continue their run. Newt Rockney thought his team couldn't be beat, and he looked at his next game versus Carnegie Tech as a warm-up for their end-of-the-season rival USC. So he took the game off, 
Yes, the head coach of Notre Dame instead went to watch the Army-Navy game in Chicago the same day as his team stayed at home to play Carnegie Tech. And the Carnegie Tech team were no strangers to Notre Dame, but they weren't looked at as on the level of Notre Dame anymore, due to Notre Dame shutting out Carnegie Tech the last few times they played them. And Newt Rockney was actually trying to get a new opponent to fill the spot in the schedule because he didn't think playing Carnegie Tech would help his team. And well, he probably should have done that because without Rockney on the sideline, it boosted Carnegie Tech. Along with that, Rockney had given his top assistant and future head coach Hunk Anderson a game plan to stick by, but didn't have a contingency plan for if his team was losing, which would have come in handy as Carnegie Tech rushed out to a 13-0 first half lead. With Anderson and the Notre Dame team scrambling, they stuck by the plan, which didn't make it any better, and they suffered a stunning 19 to nothing loss. The loss was so shocking that when Rockney was told about it in Chicago, he didn't believe it at first, but after more wire reports started to signal that it was real, all he could do was sit and be stunned. The loss ruined what would have been a national championship season and might have been one of the greatest seasons ever by Notre Dame. But now this is well known for being one of the biggest upsets and also being one of the biggest blunders ever by a legendary head coach. Only two more remaining and this is number 9, 1942 Holy Cross Upsets Boston College. This could go on a list of dominant upsets and also strangest upsets, but I'm going to put it on this list because the dominant play was that Holy Cross beat Boston College 55 to 12. The strange part was that this upset saved the lives of the losing team, and I'll explain that in a moment. But Boston College was coming into this game 8-0 and ranked in the top five in all offensive and defensive categories. Along with that, Boston College was all but assured their invite to the Orange Bowl on New Year's Day. Holy Cross, meanwhile, was just average as they were 4-4-1 and one, and had only won four games in each of their previous two seasons and had not beaten Boston College in their previous four tries. The game was looked at as nothing more of a tune-up for Boston College, as they were getting ready for the Orange Bowl and were all going to party at a huge winning party after the game at the famous nightclub Coconut Grove in Boston. Well, the game didn't go anything like anyone would have guessed, with Holy Cross dominating from the start and stopping Boston College as they won 55-12. to it was the most points Boston College had given up ever, and the loss was so shocking that 43,000 people in attendance at Fenway Park were silent towards the end. Since Boston College lost, they didn't celebrate at the Coconut Grove after the game, and it would save the team's lives, as there was a huge fire at the club, killing 492 people. So the loss was a bad way to end their season, but the loss also helped in other ways. And rounding out the biggest upsets before 1945 is 1943, Great Lakes Navy beats Notre Dame. On this channel, I covered 1943 through 1945 college football seasons, and you can see that in the playlist above, and I definitely recommend checking that out. But the reason why the Great Lakes Navy team upset of Notre Dame is on this list is because it was over an amazing Notre Dame team. The 1943 Notre Dame team had the Heisman winner Angelo Bertelli running it, and coming off the bench was a future Heisman winner, Johnny Lujak. Notre Dame had also beaten Navy and Army that year, along with the best military football team that that year in Iowa pre-flight the week before this game. In addition, after that Iowa pre-flight win, Notre Dame was given the national title from the AP, and most consider the Great Lakes game a bowl game of sorts, with Notre Dame easily winning it. The reason was because Great Lakes was a ragtag team. They had two losses on their record, and were a makeshift team of men from the base that had college and some also had pro football experience. The reason why they could play was due to wartime rules, which again I go over in my three-part series about wartime football, and Great Lakes had a few pro players, as well as a coach, Tony Hinkle, running the team, who knew had a regimen and coach a team. But in the game, the star would be a young Emil Stitko, who scored a touchdown and had an interception late in the game to give Great Lakes the 19-14 win. The game-winning touchdown was scored in the final minutes, taking the undisputed national title from Notre Dame, as other sports writers didn't name them the national champion, even though the AP still did. 
The win and the 1943 season was a big turning point for America and college football. As many teams didn't play due to college age men going off to war, so college football in the next few seasons had two or three dozen service teams playing along with Army and Navy teams. And again, you can hear more about that in my service teams documentary, and I'll put a link above for that. But thank you so much for hanging out with me and checking out the best and biggest upsets before 1945 in college football. If you liked it, please give me a like below. Also, share this video with other college football fans. As always, make sure you comment below. Tell me what other teams or what other games you think I'm missing on this list because I'm sure I'm missing some. Uh, also, make sure you subscribe to the channel below. Ring the bell for updates on future lists and future stories coming up on this channel. And of course, check out my podcast, my Patreon, and my social media in the description below. And have a fantastic rest of your day.